We're good. <laughs> good afternoon and welcome everyone to Tuesday Explorer. I'm Trudy Morata, volunteer, community ambassador with AARP Virginia here in Northern Virginia. From our earliest beginnings, AARP has championed lifelong learning and that's why AARP Virginia is thrilled to bring you our third year of Tuesday Explorers, a lifelong learning program offered every Tuesday from now through the end of April at three o'clock East Coast time for all of our curious explorers. For more than 60 years, AARP has been a wise friend and a fierce defender, helping individuals to ensure that their money, health, and happiness live as long as they do. AARP has earned a reputation as this wise friend and fierce defender through trusted information, tools, and advocacy designed to protect the health and financial security of older Americans and empower them to choose how they live as they age. So by promising to act as this wise friend and fierce defender, AARP is helping people who are 50 plus and their families feel confident in control and secure as they age. As this wise friend in your corner, AARP helps you protect yourself and your loved ones from, our, from fraud through our Fraud Watch Network, get healthy and stay healthy, care for loved ones, make connections, plan a trip, learn new technologies, attend a class, and have fun like we're about to do with our Tuesday Explorer program. So I hope you'll continue to join us on Tuesdays and take advantage of these opportunities and more. And now let me introduce Jim Lewis. Jim is a native ninth generation Northern Virginia. That alone impresses me. He's well known here in our local area for his historical and preservation efforts, including the creation or updating of 35 plus historical markers. Hence, he has been awarded the designation Lord Fairfax <clears throat> by the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. In addition, Jim has compiled and authored several local historical booklets and keeps busy with over 40 speaking local tour engagements per year. We are thrilled to have him join us here today and to share one of his most popular talks, History's Greatest Hoaxes. So with that, I will turn the platform over to Jim. Jim, it's all yours. I'll be here to back you up. Okay, thank you, Trudy. I really appreciate it. Always good to be with AARP and their uh, significant group of folks and members and everything. <laughs> uh, this is uh, amazing how many people are attending this today. So anyway, uh, this is a two-part uh, program. I started out with 20 hoaxes. And then uh, the more I looked at it, I decided it was just too much for one presentation. So I split it in half. And I actually presented this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I found out that uh, I could use a little bit more material, particularly in the first part, which you'll hear today. So anyways, I've kind of changed things up just a little bit, but uh, there's still two parts. Both parts have been bulked up a tad and uh, the feedback was, a, there was a lot of fun. A lot of people had a good time with it. Anyway, before I begin, I just want to let everybody know that I'm dedicating this presentation to a good buddy of mine who passed away from cancer recently. He was an iconic storyteller. And this is the kind of story or material that was right up his alley. He was always doing off the wall stuff, Jack the Ripper, Spaghetti Western with the Wawa lady and uh, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, it's for his memory, Jim Dumphy. Um, anyway, let's go ahead and start. And as we go along, you might guess it, okay, are these hoaxes that you've ever heard of before? Uh, when I presented this again a couple of weeks ago, some other folks, uh, ironically, not many of them were known. 
So that was uh, kind of a, a good thing. Anyway, let's start. The origin of the word hoax comes from the verb hocus, as in hocus pocus, meaning magic, trickery, and flim flam. It's appropriate then that the masterminds behind the various hoaxes that have been committed throughout successive centuries have employed all manners of wizardry and artistry to pull them off, whether committed for money, notoriety, or simply for the hell of it. Society's fascination with hoaxes and the minds that created them uh, continues to this very day. Indeed, in this era of, quote, fake news, unquote, and internet scandals, our obsession with hoaxes seems to be more prevalent than ever. Today, we examine several of the most successful and outlandish hoaxes throughout history. Now, as I go through this, please remember to be cognizant of the methods of communication at the time they were perpetrated. So, without further ado, let's start with the first hoax. William Shakespeare has been the target of numerous hoaxes, but none greater than that of 19-year-old William Henry Ireland. This guy right here. 1794, growing up starved for his father's affection, who loved his collections of books, pictures, and curios far more than his only family, particularly anything with regards to Shakespeare. Anyway, William snuck into his father's study and traced a facsimile of Shakespeare's signature from a book, thus began his career. Anyway, in 1795, a year later, he presented his father with a gift, a parchment deed signed by William Shakespeare. He told his father that a friend, a Mr. H, had found it in an old trunk with uh, Renaissance manuscripts and documents, many signed by Shakespeare. He continued to bring home letters, including a love letter from Shakespeare to his wife, Anne Hathaway, including locks of her hair. Eventually, drafts of King Lear and several pages of Hamlet appeared too. News of the discovery began circulating in the London and collectors, scholars, and uh, other folks Actors flocked to the Ireland residence to view these extraordinary treasures. Demand was so great, the family started issuing tickets, and here's one right here, to control the crowds. Newspapers began publishing numerous articles debating their veracity. Already fueling a full-blown mania, William raised the deception to a higher level by unearthing an unknown quote, original five-act Shakespeare play. It was entitled Vortigern, and it was about a tragedy of a brutal fifth century king that borrowed from, believe it or not, Hamlet, Macbeth, and King Lear. And of course, everything was all written by William. In the spring, playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan decided he wanted to stage the play at his theater in Drury Lane. It opened April 2nd, 1796. And when it ended, the actors were booed and fighting broke out between believers and non-believers. The play would never be performed again and William would eventually confess. Neither William nor his father's reputation recovered from this fiasco. William moved to France where he lived for several decades. His father died claiming everything was genuine as he couldn't believe, he couldn't fathom that his son possessed enough literary talent to pull off this ruse. Okay, number two, 1971. I wouldn't doubt some of you all have heard of Clifford Irving. 
was a writer of only modest, modest success. And right here he's shown with his wife, Edith. Uh, and they claim to have the literary scoop of the century right here. The Autobiography of Howard Hughes. Now, Hughes, as you all know, was a billionaire, a business magnate, a film director, pilot, and all-around success story. As Hughes had retired from public life in 1958 and refused to be interviewed or even photographed afterwards, public interest in the recluse had soared. When Irving appeared with his autobio and letters that he said proved its authenticity, McGraw-Hill paid him uh, $765,000 at that time advance for the rights. To get the deal done, Irving bluffed his way past attorneys, publishing execs, an ever skeptical investigative journalist, and you'll know this name, Mike Wallace. The ruse began to crumble when a reporter who had written an unpublished book on Hughes noticed that some of the passages in the er ep excerpts from Irving's manuscript appeared to have been lifted from his own work. The ruse death knell was the one thing that Irving hadn't counted on. During a telephone conference with journalists on January 7, 1972, Hughes himself denied any participation in the work. Irving and a collaborator, and his collaborator, a fellow by the name of Richard Suskind, were indicted and found guilty of fraud. Irving was sentenced to two years in prison, Suskind six months. Edith got 19 months, and was forced to return money that they got from a Swiss bank account or had placed there. Now, they quickly divorced, <laughs> and uh, he, Clifford, was eventually married six times. I won't go there. Irving emerged as a celebrity, there we go, of sorts, and talked freely and easily about the phony Hughes by autobiography. In 1957, he wrote a tell-all book about the caper entitled The Hoax. In 2006, this inspired this, and that's a movie uh, by, the name of, by the same name, The Hoax. And of course, you all recognize Richard Gere. He played Irving. The film, of course, was deemed a critical success, and the Times named it one of the 10 best films of the year. Here you go. Here he is on Time Magazine, Clifford Irving. Okay, now, I wouldn't doubt some of you all heard of this particular hoax. It's really a piece of work. And you go back to 1917. We're talking WW1. And just think about the technology and a lack of uh, communication, uh, you know, that occurred back then. Anyway, one summer day in July, cousins Elsie, she was 16 years old, and Frances Griffiths, she was nine, came traipsing back into the house that their fa two families shared. Frances' shoes were soaked from playing in the stream at the bottom of the garden. When queried by her mother, she said, I go to see the fairies. Determined to support her cousin, Elsie, who's the older girl, convinced her father to lend her his brownie-like camera. And we all remember that. These things were really poor, but they worked. Saying she would bring back proof of Francis's claims. When the girls returned and the picture was developed showing Francis surrounded by four princing sprites, they were adamant that the image was real. To bolster their claim, several weeks later, they took a second photo over here, showing Elsie with a dancing gnome. Both photos 
for this presentation today, by the way, have been enhanced. Obviously, a brownie is not going to camera is not going to produce what you're looking at right now. So, the girls then made a pact to con never confess how they had taken the photos. With their parents stumped, the photos were nothing more than a puzzling family antidote. However, two years later, 1919, the school story gains traction as Elsie's mother takes the photos to a talk about fairies <laughs> by the Theosophical Society in Bradford, and that's in West Yorkshire, England. Impressed, Edward Gardner, who was the society's present, president, hits the lecture circuit in London. From there, word passed to this guy right here. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but that's Arthur Conan Doyle. He was the creator of all the Sherlock Holmes stuff. And he also had a long-standing interest in spiritualism. Doyle had several experts examine and anoint, actually anointed the veracity of the photos before publish them in the Strand Magazine in Britain in 1920. They were subsequently published in Australia and over here in the US. The images achieved worldwide notoriety, sparking fierce debate. In order to quell the debate, the girls were asked to take additional photos. Now, painted into a corner and unable to say no, the girls took a second set of photos, which were published in 1921. So there were five photos all together. 1930, Doyle dies, this fellow here. But the debate raged on for, believe it or not, 60 more years until 1983, when Elsie finally confessed that the photographs had been faked. Now, you ask why? Well, here's how, excuse me. Here's how. The fairies were, in fact, colored paper cutout drawings secured in the ground and to branches with hat pens. So there you go. Okay, this one will blow you away if you've not heard or read about it in the past. 1726, an extraordinary story emerges from the market town of Galdamin in Surrey, England, that captivated the nation. According to the reports and confirmed by three preeminent doctors, a poor, illiterate 17-year-old woman named Mary Toff had given birth to 17 rabbits and was about to deliver more. As news of the births stoked a media frenzy, Toff was taken to a bathhouse in London at the request of this fellow right here, King George I himself, while doctors awaited her next delivery. Uh, there was no 18th rabbit. After nine days, a porter revealed that Toff's husband had bribed him to smuggle in a rabbit, and the whole hoax was uncovered. Toff was arrested and later confessed that her mother-in-law had persuaded her to concoct the story as a money-making ruse. The doctors, who had so enthusiastically testified to the bizarre births, were publicly humiliated, and the fraud provided journalists, satirists, and artists fertile material for comedy for decades to come. Now, you might ask, why rabbits? Well, Mary and her income-challenged husband, who was a tailor and not very good at it, they already had two children. The first died at four months, and the second was nearly two when Mary attained national celebrity. Pregnant again, and she most likely had a miscarriage, and some weeks later, she delivered her first rabbit. 
Her strange bursts began soon after she had chased some rabbits and developed a craving for rabbit meat, which she could not afford. Hence, rabbit became her choice of fare. Okay, some of you folks out there might remember this fellow, William Castle. If not, he's the man. Late 1950s to mid-1960s, film producer, this fellow here, doesn't he look like a nice guy? His name's William Castle, and he was known as the King of Gimmicks and produced a string of low-budget feasts of gore and extravagant scares, each with its own publicity campaign, often as notable as the film itself. His film, Mr. Sardonicus, right here, released in 1961, featured the tutorial evil villain's face being twisted in a maniacal grin after seeing his father's corpse. A gimmick he used for its theatrical screenings was what was called the punishment pole. And what this was, basically a glow in the dark, thumbs up, thumbs down, placard. Toward the ends of the film, toward the end of the film, a break was taken and Castle himself would conduct and tally a poll, pretending to address the audience while jovially engaging them to choose whether Sardonicus should live or die. Thumbs down was always selected as Castle believed the audiences would always vote to see the villain meet a horrific fate. There was no other ending. So, Additional at drive-ins, excuse me, patrons were asked to flash their car lights to vote. Additional gimmicks included, and here we go with all the gimmicks that you hear about in these theaters in decades long gone. Timely dropping of plastic skeletons from the top of the screen along a wire above the heads of the audience. He's the guy that created the buzzing theater seats under command of himself. Nurses were stationed in theater lobbies, hanging out, handing out bogus nerve steadying pills to the weak of heart. Ambulances, ambulances were parked outside the entrance of theaters. Ushers were planted in the audience who would scream as they ran outside the theater at a prearranged moment in the movie an issuance of insurance policies guaranteeing audience members against death by fright were issued. Thus, teenagers, as you might expect, attended his movies in droves. Now, some of his instant cult classics included The Tangler. This is where House on the Haunted Hill came from. This guy, homicidal straight jacket, and we've all heard of this, probably have seen it, Rosemary's Baby. Now, Castle's B-movie financial successes convinced Alfred Hitchcock to make Psycho. His autobio was entitled, Step Right Up, I'm Gonna Scare the Pants Off America. <laughs> there we go. Okay. 1912, amateur archaeologist, Charles Dawson, this fellow right here, claimed he had discovered the missing link. How many of these have we heard about over the years? Between ape and man in the gravel beds of Piltdown, Sussex County, southeastern England. Interested in the findings, Arthur Smith Woodard, he was the keeper of geology at the Natural History Museum. Excuse me, this is Dawson. This is the keeper right here, Arthur Woodward. He accompanied Dawson to the site and worked it between June and September. Surprise, surprise, they didn't find anything, really. 
Now, Dawson supportedly recovered more skull fracker, fragments, of course. He's by himself. A half of a lower uh, set, uh, jaw, a set of teeth connected to the same individual, and some primitive tools. Many speculated all were from a human ancestor 500,000 years ago. It was even given a Latin name, Eonthropus Dawson, <laughs> Dawsini, if you will. And that's after Dawson's name. And in essence, what that meant was Dawson's Dawn Man, D-A-W-N Man. 1953, now this is decades afterwards, the questionable assemblage was conclusively exposed as a forgery. This is 41 years later. It was found to have consisted of an altered mandible and some filed down stained teeth to match the surrounding earth of an orangutan deliberately combined with the cranium of a fully developed, though small brain modern human. Dawson died in 1916. The Piltdown hoax is prominent for two reasons. First, because of the attention it generated about the subject, subject of human evolution. Now, note in this slide, who's that back there? That's Darwin in the background right there. The length of time that it took, as I mentioned previously, 41 years it took to definitively expose this whole thing as a composite forgery. Why so long? At the time of the discovery, the scientific establishment, establishment believed that the large modern brain preceded the modern omnivorous diet and the forgery provided exactly that evidence. You'll love this. It also satisfied European expectations that the earliest humans would be found in Eurasia and the Brits wanted it found in Britain. In 2016, that's just a few years ago, an eight year review with DNA concluded that this guy right here, Dawson, was the sole perpetrator. Now, why? He was known to be personally, personally ambitious and he wanted professional recognition. So again, why do people do things? It's all over the map. Okay, 1884, the New York Sun publishes a breathless account of a great step for mankind. Quote, the air as well as the earth and the ocean has been subdued by science and will become a common and convenient highway for mankind. The Atlantic has actually been crossed in a balloon and in the inconceivably brief period of 75 hours from shore to shore. Now, at the time, it took two weeks to cross the Atlantic by boat. In reality, the Atlantic would not be crossed by a balloon until 75 years later. Now, the, the account was cooked up by a hoax lover in an age of hoax lovers, journalists. This fellow right here, I'm sure most of you recognize him, that's journalist Edgar Allan Poe. And he would perpetrate five more hoaxes in his lifetime. To give the article an air of authority, he included an abundance of scientific detail from precise measurements of key components down to the screws, steel wires, and combined weight of the fictional uh, passengers at 1.2 thousand pounds. Poe even referenced Monk Mason. At the time, he was a famed aeronaut pilot and whose accounts he had liberally borrowed from. And this is Poe's own words and talking about the scene this created when it came out in the paper. On the morning, Saturday, of its announcement, the whole square surrounding the Sun Building was literally besieged, blocked up from a period soon after sunrise until 2 p.m. 
I have never witnessed more intense excitement to get possession of a newspaper at any price. I tried in vain during the whole day to get a possession of a copy. The report was picked up in the next day's New York Sunday Times and Baltimore Sun, and two days later, the Sun printed a retraction. So why did he do this? Well, this was Poe's idea of a calling card. He had just moved to Manhattan looking for work as a journalist. So what better way to announce your, that you've arrived than to prank an entire city? Okay. 1964, here we are in the crazy 60s. That's a decade I consider myself growing up in, and it was insane. Anyway, the Supreme Court decided that Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, you may remember that book, had literary merit and should not be censored in a case of Grove Press versus Gerstein. Now, this opened the door to the likes of Harold Robbins' The Adventures and Jacqueline Suzanne's Valley of the Dolls. And guess what? They all topped the bestseller list. 1966, two years later, this fellow right here, and that is Mike McGrady, disgusted with the sad state of literature in America. He was a Newsday columnist. He recruited a team of 25 colleagues to clearly illustrate that popular American literary culture had become mindlessly vulgar. The group consisted of 23 men and two women. Each would write a deliberately inconsistent hodgepodge. Uh, they would all write a hodgepodge of a book with each chapter written again by a different author. Ironically, some of the characters had to be heavily edited because, or the chapters had to be heavily edited because they were too well written. And it also had to come off as written by one author. Now, the book was submitted for publication under the name of Penelope Ash. Well, who was Penelope Ash? Right here. And that was McGrady's own sister-in-law. And she's the one that interfaced with all the photographers and the publishers and all that. They used an independent publisher known as Gillian and William Blake, excuse me, Lyle Stewart. And he was known for his controversial books, many with sexual content. The story revolved about around a Gillian and William Blake who were hosts of a popular New York City breakfast show, chat show. And it was known as the Billy and Gilly Show. As you might expect, countless torrid affairs ensued. In 1969, Naked Came the Stranger. Right here. Here's the book. Right up here. And the book fulfilled McGrady's cynical expectations as sales soon reached 20,000. By August, the male authors decided to go public and walked out in single file, 23 of them now, on the David Frost show and after being introduced as Penelope Ash, all 23 of them. This revelation prompted more sales, totally 90,000 by October, by the end of the year, the, the book has spent 13 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, um, up to a decade ago, and that's all I have numbers for, 2012, uh, 400,000 books had been sold. In 1970, McGrady published a Naked Came the Stranger right here, or, quote, how to Write Dirty Books for Fun and Profit, which told the whole story of the hoax. Okay, can't go by without a little Nixon stuff. 1992, April 1st, 
National Public Radio, NPR, very popular Talk of the Nation network program reported that former President Richard Nixon had declared his candidacy for the Republican presidential nomination. Accompanying the announcement were audio clips of Nixon delivering his candidacy speech, declaring, quote, I never did anything wrong, <laughs> and I won't do it again. Whatever was wrong, he's not going to do it again. <laughs> Amazing. So Harvard professor Lawrence Tribe and Newsweek reporter, you'll recognize this, Howard Fenneman, then came on the air offering their analysis of Nixon's decision and its possible impact on the 1992 presidential race. Finally, a clip from Tory Clark, press secretary of the Bush Quail campaign was played in which she said, quote, we are stunned and think it's an obvious attempt by Nixon to upstage our foreign policy announcement today. So, the NPR phones, as you might expect, were flooded with calls expressing shock and outrage. Only during the second half of the program did host John Hockenberry reveal that the announcement had been an April Fool's Day joke. And of course, here's the fellow that played Nixon from a voice standpoint. He impersonated Nixon. And you all know this fella, that's Rich Little. So, next, 1764. Believing the fiction of the day was staid and boring. This fella right here looks real scary, doesn't he? Well, he authored a fictitious manuscript entitled The Castle of Oronto. Filled with feigning heroines, a haunted medieval castle with secret tunnels, an evil Italian villain, and a curse on the family. It was all inspired by a bad dream he had had in his Strawberry Hill house. This is the latest picture of this. This is real, and it is heck of a house. You might even call it a castle, but anyway. Um, and this is the restoration in 2012. However, it is known as one of the most extraordinary literary hoaxes in history, as he sought to increase his chances of success by publishing the book as a, quote, lost, unquote, medieval manuscript, therefore it being an anonymous publication. He created an elaborate backstory that the work had been discovered in the library of an ancient Catholic family in Northern England, and the manuscript originally was printed in Naples in 1529. When the novel met with rave reviews and praise, Walpole finally comes out of the closet and admits to the hoax, and he admits that he was the real author. Now the success, hey, I'm the guy. So what he does, he publishes the second edition, and you'll see on the bottom, it actually has his name. Surprise, surprise. So the novel is generally regarded as the first Gothic novel, a genre that would become extremely popular in the late 18th and early 19th century. And I mentioned Scary earlier about this fellow. Well, we're talking about authors such as Bram Stoker with Dracula, Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, Robert Louis Stevenson, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and of course, numerous works from our previous hoker, hoaxer of the earlier slide, Edgar Allan Poe. Their works are characterized by an environment of fear, the threat of supernatural events, and the intrusion of the past upon the present. The genre is still in vogue today, courtesy Stephen King and the like. Okay, we got two more to go, folks. 1930s through the 40s. This fellow right here, 
Dutch-born Henricus Antonius Hahn van Megeren attempted to make a career as an artist. But art critics dismissed his work, saying he lacked originality and showed little artistic talent on his own. Spurred by this disappointment, he would later say in court, and here he is in court, <laughs> yep, he ended in court, I determined to prove my worth as a painter by, by making a perfect 17th century canvas. Now, what does that mean? He was going to basically take a 1600 paint, uh, painting and he was going to redo it and make it look like it was actually authentic. Well, he decided to prove his talent, again, by forging paintings from the Dutch Golden Age. It would take him six years to perfect his artistic and deception process. Oil paint, for your information, can't take as much as, uh, it can take as much as 50 years to harden on period canvas. Hence, he eventually replaced the oil in his pigments with bakelite. He would then bake the painting at 212 to 248 degrees Fahrenheit to harden the paint and roll it over a cylinder to increase the cracks. Later on, he would wash the painting in black India ink to fill in the cracks. So by the late 1930s, critics were stunned by the exact replicas of revered old Dutch artists by Van Meegeren. Now, most of them believe that they were the real thing, though. They didn't believe that they were copies. And this continued on for years. An interesting conundrum developed at the end of World War II when it was found out that this fellow right here, Goring, right, Marshal Hermann Goring, had purchased one of Van Gemeer's, Johan Vermeer's, one of the greatest painters of the Dutch Golden Age. And he acquired it by trading 137 of the looted paintings. We've all heard of that. The Germans ripped off a lot of things. And uh, 137 of them. And this painting right here became one of his most prized possessions. That's what he ended up with. In 17, May 17, 1945, the painting, believe it or not, had been found in an Austrian salt mine, along with 6,750 other pieces of Nazi looted artwork. And I guarantee you all have seen the movie, The Monument Men found it. It was in their stash that they found. Van Meegeren was arrested and charged with fraud and aiding and abetting the enemy. Now, he claimed he was a hero for putting the screws to Goring. That didn't fly. <laughs> so here he is in court uh, in his witness stand with one of his forgeries <laughs> behind him, facing the possible death sentence. He had to confess that the painting was a forgery. He was convicted November 12, 1947, and sentenced to one year in prison. However, one and a half months later, he died from two heart attacks. A biography, and this is how significant this hoax was. A biography in 1967 estimated that Van Meegeren had duped buyers including the government of the Netherlands, out of more than $30 million. So it gives you a feel for the scope of things. Okay, last but not the least, how could we go any part of this presentation, and this is the end of part one, without bringing up P.T. Barnum? Come on, he was a consummate. Anyway, so much for preconceived uh anyway uh, what happened with this uh and i don't happen to have okay 
1842, P.T. Barnum came across a fellow who was showing an animal. And it was, a, he called it a mermaid. And P.T. Barnum was smitten. He had to buy the thing. So what he does, he buys it. And then what he does, he uh, P.T. Barnum had bought the American Museum in New York. And uh, he was showing some things there. And he decided he was going to make a big extravaganza up there. But he put together an elaborate marketing campaign, basically hoaxing all of the newspapers up there to the point that mermaid fever was resulted from it. Everybody wanted to see this mermaid. Now, as you can see, here's the advertisement. And down here, this is typical PT stuff. Previous doubts, you know, are removed. In other words, this is the real deal. And this was in his uh, pamphlet that he was handing out. He handed out 10,000 pamphlets on the street to people. As you might expect, there was a crush that attended the opening of this event. And um, unbelievably, everybody had this perception of these beautiful mermaids in their mind when they showed up. And that was a perception back then that mermaids were gorgeous ladies. So they showed up. This is what they saw right here. This is a drawing that came out of, here's P.T. Barnum, came out of his, uh, his autobiography book. This is an illustration. That's what was shown, really. And this created such a stir, people just kept flocking to this because they were abhorred by what they were seeing. As a result of the success of this, there were a lot of variants that were evolved off of this over the years. Here's one right here. And they were originally made over in Europe, but eventually the techniques were uh, you know, developed over here to put this together. And what this is, this is a, a monkey, <laughs> if you will, an orangutan. And it is sewn onto a salmon. And <laughs> the fish is the back end of this thing. So there was a technique in putting all this together. And this led to one of many hoaxes that uh, Barnum perpetrated on the American public, one of which was this fellow right here, General Tom Thumb. He was two foot tall. People loved him. And quite frankly, he was one heck of an actor, if you will. So he was able to do a lot of things and talk very well. And he just played perfectly into this. One of the things that Barnum would do when he would go and watch people just, you know, looking at Tom Thumb and talking with him at a museum is that he would wear a big overcoat, like a trench coat. And Tom Thumb wasn't there at the time. He would show up before Tom Thumb came out of the uh, curtains and everything. And he'd be asking people, well, where is he? And everybody's all excited and say, oh, he'll be out in a minute. Don't worry, he'll be out. And they kept him, well, where, where is he? Because he's not here. Well, that trench coat had a big, huge extended pocket sewn into it on the inside. Tom Thumb was in there. And he'd pop up out of that trench coat. And of course, his head would be right next to Barnum, pretty much the way it is right now. And he'd begin his act right there. So that's how crazy this stuff got. But anyway, got to have P.T. Barnum in the mix. So with that, I'm going to wrap this up. Here are several of the uh, incredible hoaxes over the decades uh, throughout the world that did exist. And these were big deals back in the day. And I've got several more next week, if you would be so kind and interested in listening and, and watching, you know, the rest of the program. So thank you very much.
Just a reminder to register for next week's program at aarp.org slash Virginia events. Jim, I got a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, one is, how do you do your research? Uh -huh. um, articles, internet. I mean, a lot of this stuff's on the internet. And it's a minor, it's like a matter of compiling and uh, putting things together. So, and I talk to people. I ask them, you know, about any hoaxes that are in their minds. And there's one next week that everybody knows about. So that's pretty much what I do. And that's just for this particular um, presentation. A lot of this stuff, you know, you can go in there and type hoax, you know, in, on the Google or whatever. And a lot of this stuff will pop up. Uh, I have another question about Harry Houdini. Is Harry Houdini something that we're going to talk about next week? No. Okay. So the um, question is, <laughs> I didn't want to jump the gun. Well, the it, question I, is, I, Harry Harry Houdini was all about exposing fraud, frauds and hoaxes in his day. Yes. What do you know about that and any truth to that? I I, I really don't know much about it. I haven't gone that uh, level depth with regards to Houdini since he wasn't one of the hoaxes that I put together. But he was as much as anything as a, a magician, if you will. So it, you could call, I mean, there's a lot of ways to discuss what, what's a hoax and how to define it. And one of the uh, presentations next week, a lot of people think it was a hoax, but it was something other than a hoax. And uh, that's kind of a carrot for next week. But uh, I'm sorry, I don't have much more on Houdini. I think that's all we've got. Someone has asked a question about who forged the artwork, but I think you addressed that. Can you just reiterate the art on the artwork? Yeah, Van Negren. Okay. Um, this guy right here. He was the one. It took him six years to put together his program. And uh, there was more to it than chemicals and stuff like that. He, he, he put together a whole narrative pitch and... He incorporated everything into, uh, you know, what he was perpetrating. One of the biggest reasons why he passed away so quickly at the end of this uh, this trial, this guy, he drank a lot. He smoked a lot. He was a chain smoker, and he drank incessantly. He lived the high life for years. So, you know, he, he enjoyed life and everything. So I would say he was in pretty bad shape, quite frankly, by the time the trial took place. So there were two heart attacks right after this trial. Within a month and a half, he was gone. Interesting. I think that's all the questions that we've got for today. Jim, this was both amazing and amusing and Thank you so much for sharing your time, coming back and joining us for uh, Tuesday Explorer. And we are looking forward to what you want to share with us next week. Just a reminder, Tuesday Explorer program will continue next week with part two of this program. You can go to aarp.org slash Virginia events, or you can click on the link in the chat box and I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. We encourage you to join us next week. Stay curious and keep exploring. I'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Trudy. If you'd go to the other email link and join us in a debrief. I don't have the other link. Um, it will be in your email. Okay, well, I'm hoping... Hope that works. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thank you.